So good morning, everyone, um, or evening, again, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to the second dialogue of the seminar series, Flows, Infrastructure, Citizenship in India and China. I'm Sarandha Jain, a postdoctoral fellow at the India China Institute at the New School. And um, to those who were here for the opening dialogue, welcome back and thank you for joining again. And to the new guests, I hope I'll be seeing more of you over the next uh, few dialogues. So since I described the overall intellectual aims of the series last time, I won't repeat that today. But to those who are new here, please have a look at our web pages, the links for which uh, will be pasted in the chat box. Um, today's dialogue called Flows reflects on how flows of people, things, resources, and natural substances encounter infrastructure and what those um, what that does to arrangements of citizenship. How is the state involved in these encounters and arrangements is something we will uh, be talking about today. Uh, the following two dialogues on Monday and Friday of next week will focus on infrastructure and citizenship respectively. Uh, so some housekeeping before we begin, the chat function is disabled for the audiences, but you're encouraged to write your questions in the Q&A box and I'll read them out to the speakers from there. Now to begin, I'd like to introduce the exciting scholars that I have the privilege to speak with today. Rita Jyoti Bandhupadhyay is an assistant professor teaching history and political economy at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research. He is the author of Streets in Motion, the Making of Infrastructure, Property and Political Culture in 20th century Calcutta. His research projects explore themes in informality, infrastructure technologies, urban history, and governmentality studies in late colonial and post-colonial India. He works on the trajectories of capitalist accumulation and urbanization in 20th century Calcutta, economic informality, post-colonial statecraft, and its relationship with knowledge, social policy, rent, and tenancy relations in South Asian cities, and mass political formation under popular sovereignty and neoliberalism. Yimin Zhao and, uh, is an assistant professor in urban planning and management at Renmin University in China, and currently also an SNSF Swiss postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Geography at the University of Zurich. Trained as a human geographer, his research focuses on spatial politics and urban political economy in China and East Asia. After previous investigations of Beijing's green belts, his current research develops along two lines of inquiry, one focusing on the infrastructural lives of authoritarianism and other looking into the urban mechanisms of global China. He's an editor of City uh, and a corresponding editor of International Journal of Urban and Regional Research. Finally, our discussant today is Antina von Schnitzler, who's an associate professor at the New School in the Julian J. Studley Graduate Programs in International Affairs, and an affiliate faculty uh, member in the Department of Anthropology. Her research and teaching have focused on citizenship, human rights, and political subjectivities, the anthropology of science and technology, liberalism and neoliberalism, colonialism and postcoloniality, energy politics, and South Africa. Her first book is called Democracy's Infrastructure, Technopolitics and Protest After Apartheid. She's currently working on a book project on coal and energy politics in South Africa. So over to you, Rita. Let's begin with you. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me properly? And Saranda, can you hear uh, me? Properly? If you could be a little bit louder, that might help. Uh, <clears throat> can you hear me properly if I speak like this? Yeah. Okay, and uh, I try to share my screen. Uh, just a moment. Sorry, uh, that function is not working. Uh, share screen, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, Uh, maybe you could just uh, use the 
full uh, slide option. Is this yes. is this working? Yes. Is this yes. working perfectly? Yes. Okay. So thank you, thank you for giving me a chance to present my work. Uh, in this presentation, I try to reflect upon some of the central concerns of the concept note uh, in the discussion series that Sarandha circulated, especially the concept of obstruction. I shall do so from the um, experience and standpoint enunciated in my recently published book, uh, Streets in Motion, uh, the Making of Infrastructure, Property and Political Culture in 20th Century Calcutta, which came out six months back from Cambridge University Press. Uh, what I develop here may be called the dialectics of capitalist urban process, whose most fundamental elements are motion and obstruction. In the city of capital, motion refers to a fetish. The bourgeois order posits motion as a metaphor for energy, positivity, and progress, a norm in capital's hagiography, and obstruction as delinquency. I argue that one can work with obstruction, the marginalized negative part of the dialectic, and assign a positive meaning to it, that obstruction belongs to the domain of human agency through which ordinary humans negotiate capital's law of motion. This methodological suggestion, I argue, offers a new perspective to view the urban process under capitalism. It enables us to study the social production of motion via obstruction. I show that urban histories can be written through the dialectic of motion and obstruction. I deploy these two words as concepts, two bricks that build the city as a process. As a process, the city is a constant interplay of both conditioning and human agency. By conditioning, I mean impersonal and hence interpersonal structural forces in society and economy that affect human action. I posit motion as a modular form of the operation of conditioning in the urban context. By agency, I mean the history that people make. The physical environment of a city is the outcome of how people dwell or make space, which in turn constitutes who they are or become. In our story, human agency appears as obstruction in its modular form. The city as a process, the dialectic of motion and obstruction that plays out in time and space can hardly be anything but historical. In my understanding, motion stands for two kinds of condition. First, the involuntary social relationship that humans get into in producing and reproducing their existence within a mode of production. And second, the forces of the self-propelled movement of capital. In short, motion in my work refers to the involuntary tendential aspects of society and the economy. In the second sense, Motion is not just the motion of capital. It stands for capital itself. At the same time, in the city of capital, motion also refers to a fetish. Much like commodities, motion is a form of appearance by which social relations between men, I quote, manifest as uh, uh, unending relation between things, exchange value. As a fetish, motion appears as a self-evident, natural, and inevitable force that stands outside of history. The bourgeois order posits motion as a metaphor for energy, positivity, and progress, a norm, and obstruction as delinquency. The motion narrative posits delay, disconnection, and blockage as matters to be conquered by the infrastructure's spatial exploits. This narrative of ceaseless motion and smoothness posits obstruction as its negation, which it must eventually overcome. I examine this powerful common sense of the motion-driven modern city and show how obstructions are internal to and constitutive of urban motion. Obstruction as a domain of human subjectivity and diversity continuously modifies motion Accessing motion through obstruction unmasks and hence denaturalizes motion and unravels 
social relations in it. Obstructions give us access to more effective narratives of human belonging. In my work, I describe through historical and ethnographic evidence how the wheels of motion come to encounter the real world through its dialectical opposite uh, obstruction. Obstructions are momentary, unstable, and creative, which attune motion and add an element of randomness to its course, making it a historically specific force operative in a particular space-time coordinate. In other words, through obstructions, the universality of motion acquires historical contingencies and meanings. Motion ceases to be the same everywhere because of the contingencies of obstruction. It can be said that obstruction renders motion a subject of historical inquiry. Obstruction offers grip to motion. Obstruction is static relative to motion, but obstruction too generates motion. Thus, obstruction is not external to motion. That is not what I intend to say, nor is it subsumed in motion. Its relationship with motion is multiple, ranging from opposition to neutrality. In the bourgeois utopia of a perfect city, motion comes to subjugate obstruction. Yet there is no certainty that the subjugation is predetermined, complete, and irreversible. There have been moments in history when obstruction has dictated the terms of motion. In the interplay of motion and obstruction, the city becomes a unity of opposites, a dialectical unity, a whirlwind. The urban historical materialist must grasp the on-ground and contingent, um, contingent uh, relationship between unity and contradiction, when and how the conjecture of difference is set in, when and how difference turns into conflicts, and when and how the conflicts get resolved either by creating new differences or by sliding slowly in indifference. Obstruction has its own praxis of motion. People's movements are all about real and everyday motion and mobility. We have to see how each of these movements engage with the ideology of motion, an ideology that legitimizes a system of domination by masking contradictions. Indeed, motion becomes the aspiration of all, and it is through such a bid universality that it can aspire towards a hegemony. Yet, all hegemony is incomplete. Capital as motion always hinders unimpeded uh, uh, or impede uh, natural motion of many kinds. There comes coercion. Motion with a capital aim impedes original um, unimpeded motion. Now, we have to note one thing here that, uh, you know, uh, there is, however, no reason to believe that motion is always and invariably a force from above and obstruction are movements from below. Consider the instance of lockdown during the pandemic an obstruction enforced from above by the nation states. In India, uh, it entailed an act of unimaginable movement of migrant workers across the country, leading to the absolute breakdown of lockdown as a policy to immobilize. During the lockdown, motion appeared as delinquency. But the mass in motion too was an obstruction, obstructing the operations of power, obstructing the technology of incarceration. Motion is never motion for all. This kind of defined motion exposes that contradiction. It exposes the obstructive undergrading of the ideology of motion. It is in this stage the, uh, of our discussion about motion obstruction dialectic that let me present a diagram to clear my muddle-headed thought process. Let us consider the following diagram. Uh, the diagram resembles the diagram uh, in general configuration of power by Ranujit Guho. I have uh, cited that. The above diagram contains a universal diet and a set of two historically specific diets. The general diet of motion and obstruction is necessarily logical, universal, and abstract. It operates in every social system. Each of the constituents of the universal diet have two constituting elements. Motion in the modular form works via a, di a dialectic of consent and force. The hegemony of motion is bound to be incomplete 
The obstruction, on the other hand, is especially essentially a critic position which studies motion as a thesis, analyzes its condition of possibility and tracks its limits. What are the terms that are set by motion? What can and cannot be said from the confines of its grammar, etc. As part of the diagram, motion and obstruction would not mutually equalize one another. Hence, there is no equilibrium. An assumption of equilibrium in an, is an assumption of perfect, fully realized hegemony, a false assumption. The presence of coercion is the reason of disequilibrium. Dialectics is perhaps another name for disequilibrium. In a given historical context, obstruction can offer a limited descent or acquire philosophical coherence and material force to overcome motion. The constituent diets are context specific and their mutual weightage or organic composition depends on the operation of strategic forces such as intersectional, solidar intersectional solidarities among social groups against hegemonic forces in a given historical context. This dialectical universe thus incorporates the very real possibilities of divergent political outcomes given the organic composition of the elements in the historically contingent diets. It also accommodates the fact that obstruction's critique of motion is immanent in the context of overwhelming hegemony of the latter. However, obstruction acquires durability only when the participants can develop a consistent world outlook challenging motion's hegemony. I, might, I now come to the last section. Having thus proposed the basic tenets of motion obstruction dialectic, let me explain how in the context of a mass democracy and competitive electoral politics, a distinct and durable political culture of obstructionism may emerge. There are many political and ideological maneuvers that you know, make obstruction durable. The creation of collective, uh, collectives to resist eviction and reclaim spaces of livelihood and dwellings is one such maneuver. Collective action in the advanced in its advanced form is informed by an emergent worldview around obstruction. As operatives in the field of action, the participants, such as street vendors in my case, in the struggle such as dispossessed migrants, refugees, the homeless, squatter groups, and street vendors develop an intricate understanding of the world around them, which they access and transform through mass action. In doing so, they operate within a coherent and con conveyable worldview, a theoretical understanding of their everyday street level activities, particularly in relation to the operations of the state and the market. Political culture of obstructionism then is a conception of the world or in Gramsci's sense, world outlook from obstructions standpoint. It emerges at the point when this worldview dissolves the contradiction between a tacit consciousness and th that unites them in anti-eviction mobilizations and a consciousness that has been internalized via traditions, value systems, prevailing ideas and institutions, a borrowed conception of the world. Obstructionism holds together this dyadic relation with motion on the one hand, motion is subverted, on the other, it is accommodated by being punctuated. In one, it unites a struggling group with other oppressed classes during anti-eviction mobilizations. And in another, it submits to the state capital complex and forms a continuum of subordination, giving motion a grip on the soil and a local material cultural form. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm done. Thank you, Ritu. That was really interesting. Um, Yimin, would you like to speak now? Yeah, no problem. Sharing the slides now. Can you see the slides properly? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. And also thank you to New School and to Saranda for organizing this fantastic series of events. Um, in the next 10 or 12 minutes, I'm just going to show you some recent moments 
in the transformation of the urban political in Beijing through the lens of urban infrastructure. So the title of the talk is Flows of People, Flows of Water, and the Flows of Cars, the Political Infrastructure of Exclusion in Beijing. The first I want to introduce some background information regarding to the flow of people, or to be more specific, about the disciplining of the flow of people in the recent urban agenda in Beijing. And then I will shift the focus to two moments or two infrastructural events that are contributing to the disciplining of the flow of people. One focusing on the making of a wetland park and the other focusing on the, the new parking politics under what I call smart ex exclusion. And in the end, I, I hope I can draw out some implications for further discussion, for the reflections on the, on the political infrastructure of exclusion through the, the three flows I'm going to introduce. So we all know Beijing is a big city, but you might not know that clearly how quickly this city has been expanding. Basically, the population of Beijing nearly doubled in less than two, in just two decades. In the mid 1990s, it, the population of Beijing was just a little bit more than 11 million. But several years ago in the mid 2010s, the population is around uh, nearly around 22 million. So it's quite shocking, not just for observers from afar, but also for the local authorities. And in the most recent Beijing of the Must Plan, the municipal government announced that the urban population is to be kept at 23 million by and after 2020. In other words, there should be no more than 23 million people in the city. And that is the starting point of the, 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 the whole story I'm now going to narrate. In addition to the overall goal of controlling population, there is also an additional concern regarding to the central part of the city. The population of the central area should be kept at just 11 million and it should be reduced by two to 3% every year from 2017. So this is the background, why and how the Beijing municipal government gradually initiated what they called the remedying and upgrading agenda. And they have been coordinating plenty of urban housing and industrial policies to contribute to this goal of population control. So this is maybe one of the most significant moments in the implementation of that new urban agenda in Beijing. This photo was taken by a reporter of New York Times in the winter of 2017. And um, what happened to this informal settlement? Um, a fire happened there and unfortunately killed 19 people. All of them were migrant workers or the floating population that been targeted by the municipal policies. After the fire, the municipal government that declared that to prevent these people from the risk of fire, they need to demolish settlements like this. So more than a dozen of them being demolished overnight and displacing hundreds of thousands of migrant workers. Some of them simply went back to their hometown in other parts of China. Some of them went to the surrounding provinces around Beijing. And a majority of them decided, decided to stay put, but they have to move further away from the city center in the remote parts of the city. This is one approach of controlling population that is simply to demolish the settlements, they are concentrated. But there are some other approaches, some other measures or methods that, that seem to be inclusive, supportive, and even fancy at first glance, but also contribute significantly to the goal of population control, like this one. This is a wetland park just being established in the past three years. It covers a total area of more than 40 square kilometers. And uh, maybe one background information for this case is Beijing has long been notorious for the lack of water resources. And the reason why there is a cap of the urban 
uh, population in the mass plan is exactly because of the lack of water resources. That 23 million people, that population number is calculated by the annual water resources that can be consumed in the city. Then in this city with a, a shortage of water resources, how can a wetland park be possible? So here, basically two materials are critical in enabling the building of this wetland park. One is water, another is land. Regarding the water part, a majority of water as through my investigation is linked to the mega infrastructure in China called the South to North Water Transfer Project. It was initiated at the beginning of the 2000s and completed in the mid of 2010s, just several years ago. With this project, water from the Yangtze River in Southern China is now directly transferred to Beijing. And actually the underground water level because of this project, the underground water level in Beijing rose more than dozens of meters. And this is the background that where the water is from. And another part, the land. To understand how land is made available for this park, we may need to do a gene, to analyze the genealogy of this place. And thanks to the Time Machine Street view from Baidu, here we can see what this place used to be 10 years ago in 2013. It used to be a cluster of villages, the um, villages in the Jiehebu area those informal settlements, more than a dozen of them. And all of these villages in total, they accommodated nearly a quarter million people. And of course, most of them were migrant workers, the floating population. When I was doing my field work for the PhD back in the 2015, I by chance witnessed the process how these villages were demolished. But when I was in the field at that time, I had totally no idea what the place will be turned into until several years later. When I finished my PhD, I returned to Beijing. I saw the coexistence of two phenomena here. One is the building of that huge wetland park. And the other is the displacement of that one quarter million people. Or in other words, the making of this wetland park is at the cost of the everyday life, memories, desires, and potentialities of this one quarter million people. And this is how urban infrastructures could contribute significantly to the population control goal of the municipal government. Now we can shift the focus to the third flow, from the flow of water to the flow of cars. Here is a map of the core area of the city. It's just the, the geographical center uh, surrounding the Forbidden City and the Tiananmen Square. And as many of you already know, it's also where many of the uh, headquarters of the central government departments were located in. So with the instruction from the central government to make this core area quiet, this is a, a quote from that central government ordinance. To make this area quiet, Beijing municipal government has to find out some innovative ways to reduce the density of the area, to add more green spaces, to control the traffic flows. Here is a, a quote from the interview, one of the interviews I did last year with the with street officers in the core area. I was told that quote starts, we were encouraged to put forward such policies in an autonomous mode. Many streets were experimenting the guidelines and competing with each other to be the first street achieving the goal of being quiet. We also had a try. With three teams and 20 coordination meetings in 2019, we demarcated around 2,000 parking spaces and issued about 15,000 certificates for local households to enjoy the discounted rate of parking fees. So 
these parking spaces, they did not exist before. Now they are produced. But the rate for parking here is not equal for everyone. For those who are recognized as local, they can enjoy a 97% discount. So basically, for, for, for people from elsewhere, you need to pay about two US dollars for one hour parking here. But for the local people, you only need to pay six cents. That's the 97% discount. But how to achieve this goal? How to control to, to tell which car belongs to the local, which car belongs to someone from elsewhere? This is when some new technologies being deployed. Here, here you can see some photos of the RFID readers being embedded under underlying each and every parking space along the streets I just mentioned. We all know that for um, RFID system to work, there, there should be two parts. One is the RFID reader, another is the tag. So the readers are embedded here. And what happened to the tags? Here, I learned from the street officers that they have a five-in-one authentication protocol. That means if you want to get this tag to, which means you are local, you need to bring your household, household registration, your ID card, your real estate certificate, your driving license and the vehicle registration to the street office. And you need to make sure that this real estate certificate attaches to a flat within this area. And also the name on the other four documents should be the same as the one who owns the flat. So this is how the local officers, they recognize who are local. And in the end, only a very small portion of people who live here could be recognized as being local. And here, maybe we can also borrow some sentences from Hayos in her 2009 paper. She said, RFID is not about the material object, but where it came from, where it is, how long it stays there, when it goes away, and what comes next. In this vision, RFID participates in a larger transition to a world where human action is coordinated with complete virtual actual environments character, characterized by flows and relations between many different agents. And here in the case of the street I just mentioned, through this control of the flows of cars, we can see that even though there are no lines, no boundaries, physical one, between different districts or streets within the city of Beijing, some invisible walls have already been established. Eventually for the goal of making this core area quiet. So when we combine the three flows, the flows of people, the flows of water and the flows of cars, maybe the first implication we can draw out is now, at least in the city of Beijing, Ex exclusion is more and more working like infrastructure events. They are conditioned by technologies and by flows of things. And in these events, we can also see the operationalization of citizenship, which means citizenship is now articulated environmentally through the distribution and feedback of monitoring and urban data practices. And I also want to add, there are also some other urban practices that are involved as well. So in the end, through these infrastructure events of population control, maybe we can say that the urban subjects are now being transformed by the state conduct. It's, they are not just targeting on the urban population as a whole, but they are creating, they are producing some new user categories. Those who can enjoy the green space, those who are eligible, for the discounted rate of parking and so on and so forth. And you, if you are unfortunately not belonging to any of the user categories, then you will be excluded. So by remaking these urban subjects, eventually what kind of urbanism will be achieved? That remains a question and should be interrogated. <laughs>
Yeah, this is a summary of my talk. I basically I introduced the flow of people and its discipline in Beijing and how this is achieved through some infrastructural events like the making of the wetland park and the use of smart exclusion. Mm, I hope this can shed some new light for further discussions in today's event on um, 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 flows, infrastructures, and citizenship. Thank you. Thank you, Yemen. Um, and Tina, can I ask you to jump in now? Sure. Um, so thank you, Saranda and the ICI for organizing this great series of events. I thought Monday's event began with a very productive discussion. And I also very much enjoyed reading Rita Jyoti's and Jimin's papers for this session. And I actually think they speak to some of the questions raised on Monday in interesting ways. And maybe we can get to that in the discussion. This week's panel is organized around the theme of flows, and I thought it might be helpful to start out by thinking a bit about the history of, the, of this concept. Um, in the late 1980s, Manuel Castells coined the phrase space of flows to describe processes of globalization, precipitated by liberalization on the one hand and the rise of new information technologies on the other. Building on the Marxian conceptions of circulation, the space of flows he suggested powerfully at the time was in the process of superseding the space of place, producing new geographies of inequality and transforming cities in the process. Shortly thereafter, Arjuna Padurai took up the concept of flow in order to describe the processes of cultural globalization. The concept he suggested needed to be disaggregated in order to account for the complex transformations affected by globalization, which could not, captured by, could not be captured by terms like westernization and so forth. Flows of capital, ideas, and people may not be isomorphic, he suggested. Indeed, there may be disjunctures between them, such that, for example, liberalization produces flows of capital while simultaneously blocking flows of people at more heavily uh, policed borders. Similarly, finance and information technology may spread rapidly without necessarily leading to a flow of ideas or ideologies. On the other hand, one might think of flows as that which is enabled by infrastructure in relation to citizenship, such as flows of provisioning or distribution. Social citizenship and perhaps also contemporary demands for the right to the city are at least in part demands to participate in, and access the flows of the city, whether that is water, transport, information. And here the city is often conceived as a kind of organism or metabolism. In turn, such flows produced new governmentalities that from the 19th century onwards came to conceive of the city as inhabited by populations with particular needs um, and that imagined flows of water, electricity or gas to, pr to produce not just health, but also new norms of civic propriety and governability. Infrastructures and the, flow and the flows they enable and help shape and curtail could thus be seen as a material embodiment of a particular kind of biopolitics, a material connection to the state that in turn shapes novel terrains of political action. Taken together, these two papers um, touch on each of these understandings of flows, with Rita Jyoti's paper perhaps more focused on the former sense via his concept of motion of obstruction, and Yemen more interested in the latter form in his examination of infrastructural forms of state power and the political mobilization of infrastructure in a context of urban deformation, which by itself I thought was an interesting term, and maybe you can talk more about that. Um, Rita Jyoti deploys the concept of motion and obstruction to explicate the dialectical process through which the city is produced. And this theoretical elaboration emerges from his recently published study of Kolkata, Streets in Motion. I think it would be immensely helpful for our understanding of this concept of motion obstruction uh, for uh, um, to learn more about the research in which it is based. So my first request to Rita Jyoti is to tell us more about the story he tells in his book and how the concept to develops in this paper emerge from and help elucidate this context. Um, my second question is one of clarification. Um, Rita Jyoti defines motion as on the one hand, a structural force in, in modes of, uh, in, in a mode of production and one that is he suggests with Marx dominant and capitalist modes of production. 
On the other, emotion also references a fetish, an ideological concept uh, akin to quote unquote free circulation. I wondered if there may be a risk that these two notions get conflated. In other words, that in using the same concept, we run the risk of fetishizing capital rather than seeing it as a social relation. So I wondered how it would shift the analysis if one kept these two meanings of motion separate. And I'm asking this in part because I wonder whether if we leave behind the ideological concept of motion, um, uh, we might also destabilize this idea that motion is in most instances the dominant structural force. From my own perspective of having done research in South Africa, obstruction was in fact the primary modus operandi of the apartheid state, preoccupied as it was with controlling movement. Thus created was a racial economy that channeled millions of black subjects via labor bureaus, rail tracks, and pass books to factories, mines, and farms, while at the same time sequestering them in townships and bunch of stands. So here infrastructures work not merely to enable flow, but just as much to impede and circumscribe movement. And while South Africa is no doubt an extreme and often of course, and also of course, illiberal, non-democratic case, um, the post-apartheid state has often continued to rely on such tactics of sequestration, if now often at less visible um, and less macrological scales. So I wonder if rather than thinking of motion as prim the primary dominant force and obstruction as one from quote unquote below, could we think of motion and obstruction as rather as strategic and contingently deployed in capitalist economies by states, social movements, and ordinary residents? And of course, Rita Jyoti himself also gets at this point very clearly in different parts of the paper. For example, when he discusses the lockdown and, and the sort of techniques that came with it. Um, I also had to think back to Townsend Middleton's reflection on choke points here and what he called the quote unquote operative paradox. That is the need on the one hand to speed up the flow through the choke point and the simultaneous need to police this flow. Imperatives which he showed are often at odds. So I think it is in part to think through these kinds of historical contingencies that I would love to hear more about your research on streets, um, Rita Jyoti. Um, this also gets me to Yimin Jang's paper on authoritarian urbanism and projects of de-densification in which some of these contradictions come to the fore. So even when infrastructures do not attack as they do in Julie Chu's focus on the more violent ways of urban restructuring temporary China, though they seem to do this in this instance too, Yimin shows that they produce new topologies of inclusion and exclusion. Spectacular, seemingly inclusive infrastructures such as wetland parks are at the same time displacing unwanted residents from the city. Similarly, new technologies to regulate the flow of cars at the same time come with new security technologies that have exclusionary effects and produce new kinds of urban subjects. And in the process of telling the story, Yimin unearths novel dividing strategies enabled by such technologies. And I, I was reminded here of Brian Larkin's insight that while infrastructure in its most basic definition is quote unquote matter that moves matter, it also operates at a range of other registers from the spectacular nationalist symbolism of large scale infrastructures to the more mundane affective and sensory effects they prompt and the subjectivities they help shape. And as we saw last week in Kamin Wu's work, in this capacity, they can also be resignified and reassembled um, um, through protest or civic actions. So one question I had was for, for Yimin was how we might think about politics in this context, which I believe is also at the heart of Yimin's larger project of which this paper is a part. Um, so I was hoping he might talk a little bit more about that aspect of the project. And specifically because I feel like it gets us back to what Kaming was talking about on Monday. Um, in Yemen study, infrastructure and the flows they prompt or enable are at the same time conduits of power and terrains for the negotiation of citizenship. This type of material politics can be found in many different places and in multiple formations. So another question for Yemen is related to the one I asked Kaming and Townsend, uh, Townsend last week. Is what Yemen calls authoritarian urbanism specific to contemporary urban transformations in China? And it might very well be. Or could it help us think through dynamics elsewhere, say in a place like South Africa, where the democratization of the state often, uh, the, but despite democratization, the state often continues to rely on these kinds of authoritarian practices in its dealings with urban residents. 
So if so, can the extraordinary moment in Chinese infrastructure development help us understand processes that remain less visible elsewhere? And lastly, returning to the two senses of flows I mapped out earlier, my last request to both speakers um, is to think with and through each other's concepts. How might Rito's focus on the dialectics of motion and obstruction help, help in analyzing processes underway in Chinese infrastructure development? And how might Yemin's focus on infrastructure and novel modalities of state power be relevant in thinking through Rita Jyoti's study of Calcutta and Indian cities more generally? Thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Rita, would you like to, to be first? I will then follow. Rito, you are muted now. Okay, is that fine? So thanks, yeah. Antina. These are terrific comments. I, I just try to uh, 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 deal with it as much as possible. Uh, <clears throat> the storyline, I'm not going into it because the book is available. So I'm just talking about the three major objectives that, uh, that made me do this research. Probably that will help us ground the, the dialectic. So I had three central objectives in this book. First, I study the production of urban space and motion as a spatial process in colonial and post-colonial contexts through the life of the streets. My desire was to unravel the colonial and post-colonial imports of relationship between urbanization and accumulation in Calcutta, a city that you know moved from Europe's second city to India's dying metropolis in the 20th century autobiography of capital. So I tried to contest this hegemonic representation of Calcutta by documenting how uh, a low circuit people's economy, which I called obstruction, uh, kept the city vibrant in all these decades of apparent decade, decadence and disorder. The second objective of the book was to take part in the new property turn in Indian urban historiography. Probably you know that a lot of people are talking about property nowadays, Devjani's work and all, uh, <clears throat> uh, Anisha's work. So historians have largely restricted themselves to the pursuit of private property, land acquisition and uh, compensation. Through this, they have woven city-specific narratives about colonial institutions, social practices, and you know, life of property in political, in political mobilizations such as communal riots. But as they follow private property archives, their research tends to get restricted to the world of the rate-paying and almost exclusively male property class, who were also the enfranchised population of these cities in the late colonial decades. Studying colonial cities through private property, rent, and enfranchisement has, I've thought, its own core concerns, but also leaves out certain matters of significance. So these studies have not paid rigorous attention to the urban commons and consequently relationship between private property, public space, or property. That is where property is in motion, basically, various phases of metamorphosis of property and the urban commons. I got, I, I, Try to go. I try to go beyond the domain of formalized property, both private and public, to consider the dynamic interconversion between property and urban commons, which makes capital accumulation and in and through space possible. While the conversion of commons into private and public property is well documented, one has also witnessed the conversion of public and private space into commons in the phenomenon of the communal aggregation of neighborhoods and gated communities serving a particular community exclusively. The communal cleansing of ethnic or religious minorities from a majority community dominated neighborhood and the you know, connection of certain minority populations into ghettos because of a civil war in the city that happened repeatedly uh, are more you know, examples of such forms of uh, conversion and community. In both instances, I would say, new spaces emerge uh, that are open to the members of certain communities and vital for life and labor. Uh, I call this commoning as community. There is, however, another way in which commons form in the cities. Urban commoners, 
such as street hawkers, refugees, and pavement dwellers encroach upon public properties and turn them into collectively occupied spaces. So there are two crucial dimensions to the commons in the urban uh, that the urban commoners make. So first, the commons are source of livelihood and dwelling for them. And second, they use the commons through variable local arrangements and that are more or less equilibrium, incorporative and fair. There is a literature. So this is, I call, you know, commoning as class. So such, uh, you know, this, this is the thing. And there is another triad that <clears throat> goes into it, that is property, territory, and accumulation. So I also, the third point was that I also <clears throat> probe into the relation between space, that is infra infrastructure and polity, superstructure, and describe materialities of political culture. I show how popular sovereignty materialized in space in the 20th century city. I argue that popular and collective actions on the streets were not merely epiphenomenon of property relations. It was in the fact, in fact, the indeterminacy of popular politics on the streets that reframed the contours of cities, political economy and infrastructure through the 20th century. Thus, in tracing the dialectic between planning and dwelling, physical space and social space, I considered political economy not just within, you know, its usual domain of the government, the law and the planet apparatus, but also parallelly within the unlikely domains of public action on the streets. In this sense, the crowd is not simply the dialectical antithesis of the planner. It performs some of the instances of groundwork. Of planner. So in this whole story, the street is the framing device, uh, which is also a metaphor. The streets of Calcutta were imbricated with rich histories of political struggles and livelihood, turning it into a metaphorical space where human rights, equality, dignity, could be asserted. I harness this narrative power of the street as I weave my stories of locomotion, property, renewal, communalism, protest, and livelihood in 20th century city. And in reading uh, the city in this way, we come to, I, I claim that we come to a deeper understanding of the social production of its motion. So uh, that, is the, uh, that is the broad uh, thing. And motion and obstruction, to be very clear, as I posited it as interpenetrative and, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, reciprocally interdependent, they do not refer to two different processes. They are one process considered in differ different aspects, different elements. So in moments, you will have reversal. That's why uh, I kept it open-ended. You saw that, you know, during lockdown, something happened or the right-hand side of my uh, dialectical uh, uh, graph that I shared, it is all contingency. You never know which one is dominating where in what particular context. For example, in 1996-97, capital completely almost, you know, corporate capital bypassed Calcutta. Bypassed Calcutta to the new towns, basically, that's that surrounded Calcutta. Because popular movements were so strong that, uh, you know, Calcutta could not be converted into a bourgeois city. So at that point of time, I, I would say there emerged a culture of obstructionism. So the whole point came from Benjamin's notion uh, of, uh, I, I quoted Benjamin, that in any epoch, there is a negative part of the dialectic, of a dialectic. And that negative part has to be infused with positivity. The moment you do it with motion and obstruction, obstruction it is obstruction that has to be bolstered with agency. So uh, that is what, I did, but I don't dispute that they flip and they reverse their order of dominance. For example, so this is this is uh, this is what I say. And the second point about fetishizing capital when you club uh, club say ideology hegemony fetish on the one hand and structural force on the other hand and club it into uh, into motion itself, then. Uh, the categorical act of motion gets lost, if you uh, say so, right? Uh, I, 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 uh, how will you then categorize, define motion? Because there are so many impulses going on. I think that is what I sort of tried to do. Obstruction is an archive for me, because otherwise motion is everywhere 
very same. Obstruction is the archive that gives me a sense of how motion is working in what context, in what form. So, uh, so when we read the narrative of the book, yes, I could uh, point out where motion stands for what, basically. So, but that came only in the narrative, not in the structure. So, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I think this is what I wanted to say. Uh, but thank you very much. Thank you. Yimin, do you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Antina, for your wonderful comments and questions. So for the time's sake, maybe I just try to respond to your questions di directly. First, how to think about politics in, in the context of what I just described. Um, on the one hand, I'm, I have that feeling that through decoding those infrastructure events, I'm actually inside that political dynamics that's unfolding now. And that's the strongest feeling after 2018 when I returned to China is exactly what I described in the, in the slides that the an, an alternative mode of exclusion is being established. And that's the kernel of current urban politics in Beijing. That's what I feel. Uh, but on the other hand, I also agree that this is not all of the pol political dynamics. There are some external externalities that I should look into as well, uh, beyond those infrastructural events per se. For example, um, yeah, and for this concern, I need to follow up with the lived experiences of those infrastructures. And here I can give very quick two, two quick cases. One is um, in, in one of those informal settlements that remained not being demolished yet. I recently, during my field work, I recognize they are quite cleverly trying to, you know, take use of those, of those elements that's available for them to make use of the very limited space as much as possible. That's what I learned that that's, um, you know, though there are limitations, they are still trying to make their lives as, as good as possible. That's one case in the informal settlements not being demolished yet. And with that uncertainty on when it would be demolished, they are still, still living their lives as, as proper as possible. And the other case is about another field site, also related to the flow of water. It's um, reconstruction of the water of the river landscape next to the Sanliton area, the embassy area in Beijing. So it was, you know, like any other places, water front gentrification scenario. It was upgraded to a very high level landscape and public space and targeting the, the new middle class, the white collar people working nearby and also not far away from the CBD area. But that is exactly the area when we see the white paper protest in last November. And actually the same user group, those new middle class. And this, yeah, that reminds me of another externality. And I think I should follow up with, with moments like this to better understand the politics. Yeah. And about the authoritarian, authoritarian urbanism elsewhere, and exactly that's maybe a further implication that we can draw out. So in the previous decades, we have always been talking about a new liberal urbanism or new new liberalization. And I I quite I quite I yeah, I quite concur with Ehua Wong's observation that new liberalism should not be seen as a mega framework to you know, to look into every case through that single perspective, but instead as a traveling technology. It can be articulated with totally different regimes, totally different kinds of political economy. And in my mind, I think the, uh, that element, those elements I observed in Beijing with regard to authoritarian urbanism, it could also be observed in, for example, London, Berlin, or New York, 
-hmm. It doesn't matter what political regime is at work. Those elements, those authoritarian endeavor is like a governmental technology that can be traveling as well. And I'm, I have a further speculation, but I don't have any research on it. Is together with the traveling of these authoritarian urbanism elements, how and how far are they also articulated with populism, with mm -hmm. variegated populism in different contexts? That could also be a very interesting direction to do research on, I think. And then um, to make dialogue with Rito's observations from Calcutta. So first, um, based on his framework on the dialectics between motion and abstraction, this actually first reminds me of the role of the significance of urban political economy. So basically my doctoral thesis was about the urban political economy in China, about how the, the state manages to make a lot of revenues in the name of making green belts in Beijing. And now, if we are going to look into those infrastructures right now, maybe it's also equally important to see, to see how these infrastructures are making new business opportunities for both state and non-state actors. That, that's, that's what I learned. One, one lesson I can learn from the motion obstruction dialectics, that means um, that logic of capital is always hunting. Yeah. And I agree with this point. But on the other hand, I have um, a question mark, or maybe later we can talk more in the, in the, in the last phase of discussion. But I, I also want to inquire if we can rethink the concept of motion when we put India case and Beijing case together, which means to what extent can we only understand motion like a hegemony? like um, the, you know, the mechanism of the logic of capital. So for example, in Calcutta, the bodily movements of those street vendors, are they only obstructions? Or we can also see them as motions per se. Or for example, in the informal settlement I just mentioned, those migrant workers that moved from the previous settlements already demolished, they now settled down again in another settlement. They are trying their all they can to, to make their urban life possible at the urban periphery. Are these things, are these movements not also some other kinds of motion? And if we recognize or appreciate these movements as motions, then maybe we can see these motions not as being absorbed within the hegemony of capital of, of the capitalist dynamics, but instead as residues in Lefebvre's words, as residues that's, that's engaged with the hegemony, but also with counter hegemonic potentials. So yeah, that's what I think I'm thinking about motion, actually also in line with Anita, yours comment on that concept as well, yeah. That's what I want to share for now. Thank you. Saranda, we should open it up, right? Or, yes. or we can come back in? Um, yes, so there are a few questions from the audience. Um, if you would like me to, I mean, if, if you're ready to uh, receive questions from the audience, Rita and Newman, I can uh, do that now. Or if you have further discussion with each other, maybe we can. Go on with that a little bit. I think you can start. Uh, from okay. Me. Okay. So um, there are two questions for Yemen. One from Andrew Grant, who asks, "I'd be curious to learn about other practices or infrastructural events that were part of the competition for a quiet central Beijing. Did a certain model win out for the whole area, or is it a complex fabric of smart exclusion practices?" Mm -hmm. um, another one from Amy Zhang for Yemen. Uh, rural workers are the informal economy, have been critical to the uh, development of Chinese cities and their labor fulfill many infrastructural functions. What is the political economic implication 
of the spatial and social eviction of migrant workers from Chinese cities? And how does the state rationalize this spatial exclusion? There's also a question for uh, Ritu from Aditi Day. Reflecting from the case of Calcutta, how did the shift from colonial to post-colonial political economy reflect in the motion obstruction dialectic in the urban space in Calcutta? Are there any instances you could speak from? Okay. So let Maybe the I can speak. Yeah, I mean, speak yeah, first yeah. and then I jump. Yeah. According no to problem. The yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to first respond to Angel's questions. Um, yeah, the street I just mentioned, they were the first. They figured out the first model of dealing with the traffic flows. And um, it used to be promoted by the municipal government in other streets as well. But in the last six months, things have been changed fundamentally. To be to put it simply, basically the, the model from the street I observed is now just stopped. All their parking spaces now being absorbed by the municipal level. The, the, the municipal government run new system, a new system um, with a city-wide camera charging system. So they establish cameras every, for example, 50 meters in the very high pillars, uh, attached to the high pillars. And that camera can take photos of every vehicle that has been using the parking space. And then, yeah, it's very automatically and it's right connected to the municipal financial system. So the municipal government basically, they recognized the business opportunity of running the parking space business. And they are now trying to monop monopolize all the parking spaces within the core area of the city, while at the same time achieving the, the goal of making it quiet. That's actually very political economy. And maybe I can borrow more from Rito's discussion on motion. Yeah. And uh, another, the second question I from Amy, also thank you for your question. Why? Why try to get rid of those people when they are very critical? This is also a very interesting question I want to ask those authorities. And from my knowledge, I think this is, this is very political. Basically, it's because our president think, thought back in the 2013, 2014, he thought Beijing is not good enough to be branded as a proper capital city of China. So he, President Xi Jinping had a clear image of a proper capital city, what, what, what that kind of capital city should be. And among them, as we already saw from those infrastructure events, among them, they should be high tech, should be green, should be international. You know, that kind of lures of being modern, the so-called Chinese style modernity or Chinese style mo modernization. And for this reason, like migrant workers were actually later categorized by the local authorities as low end population. They are not high end, so they should be got rid of, even though they are critical. And this is actually linked to the word urban deformation and Antina just mentioned. By urban deformation, I, I was simply trying to highlight three things. The first one is the demolition of more than 200 million square meters of housing in the past five years in the city, 200 million square meters. All were just built in very good condition but they are not high end. And another one is I mentioned about the flow of people, hundreds of thousands of those migrant workers that left Beijing. And it's very interesting if you go to see the statistics of the city. From 2019, the population of the city decreased in every single year since 2019. It's a city of 22 million people 
but its population is decreasing. That's basically because many people are now moving away. And a third phenomenon that's associated to urban deformation is about the financial failure of the municipal government. Um, when deputy director of the Municipal Bureau of Finance even cried publicly in a 2020 press conference saying to the media that Beijing municipal government now is in a very difficult situation. They cannot pay for some basic infrastructures, you know, because of the deformation. So here, maybe this is one element of the authoritarian urbanism that cannot be seen in many other places. That's a very strong power at the central government that can, can deform a city. Yeah, that's, that's my response. Thank you for the two questions. Should I go, Saranda? Uh, should I start? Hello? Yes. yes. Yeah. Acha, just tell me, uh, I want to club one of Antina's questions, uh, yeah, yes, uh, co-panelists' question and uh, Aditi's question. So how much time do I have roughly? Um, I don't want so to we end around. Since we started five minutes late, we have till 11.35. Um, so, which is in Indian time, this is uh, oh, nine, 9 so You have about 15 minutes. 15 but minutes. So, I, I can, I can not speak a little time. bit because I think the storyline has to be given. Otherwise, uh, there is a lot of scope for divergent opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so, I give you the storyline as precisely as possible. So, street building was one of the means by which, that's how I start the book. Uh, street building was uh, one of the means by which the colonial state consolidated itself in urban space by what's, what Torfi calls monopolizing the legitimate means of movement. Streets in motion opens with the birth of a professional class of mobile urban uh, experts comprised of civil engineers, planners, valuers as agents of liaison between the three great variables of territory communication and speed. In the early 20th century, uh, preparing itself for the complex coexistence of modern and more primordial means of human locomotion. I then moved to another interesting part uh, of Calcutta. In 1911, the colonial authorities set up an expert managed improvement trust, insulating from the fast democratizing municipal corporation whose street schemes in the central city were deliberately run through the bastis or slums uh, and the streetless neighborhoods to produce a more legible and automobile friendly urban landscape. The violence of planning, uh, you know, planned street and infrastructure building often associated with a mix of commercial public health and con counter insurgency uh, initiatives valorized urban land and it became one of the prime outlets of capital in Calcutta in the interwar years. The Improvement Trust, which was at the helm of street building, was able to create wealth in Calcutta by means of the development of trading, uh, development and trading of property. It, go, it did so by strategic devaluation and revaluation re re of asset values at certain junctures in the interwar period. The operations of the trust enabled certain investors in real estate to capitalize on our on upward revaluation re 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 of asset values. This process unfolded in the separation of the urban poor from their sites of production and social reproduction as congested neighborhoods and bastis in the inner city made way for viable neighborhoods, uh, you know, you know, viable neighborhoods as land in the market. This led to the speculation in empty land and gentrification along the axis of class, religious communities, and ethnicity. Simultaneously, dwelling, spa dwelling spaces were converted into commercial spaces. I extensively used various kinds of archives between 1911 and 1947, and the trust did registers to document this conversion process. Because of speculation, gentrification, com and commercialization, a housing crisis ensues in the interwar period. During the interwar years, Calcutta also bled into the rural semi-urban frontiers as the Improvement Trust acquired land 
and built infrastructure for the sub, uh, suburban expansion of Calcutta. Yet the, this, this, this vision of class-based graded dispersal of population from the inner city towards the newly created suburb felt as land speculation reached these places before the inner city dis displaced populations could be resettled there. Uh, moreover, in the southern frontiers, the urban process faced some hitherto unprecedented obstructions in the form of repeated incidents of organized soil raids, legal challenges from substantial property owners, refusing compensation packages. One case formed from one road reached to the Privy Council, for instance. Allegations of cash scam between contractors and trusts officials and overall marshy terrain dotted with water bodies requiring considerable mobilization of art and rubbish from elsewhere. Class and communal tension made their way through their speci this spatial demographic churning and produced intermittent communal riots between 1910 and 1926. In the early 20th century, Calcutta, religious polarization appeared in a confounding conjuncture, conjunction with the improvement trust street building initiatives. This is a major chunk of the book. We find the rational action of the street building and the invisible hands of the real estate market and crowd action during communal outbreaks constituted each other in a complex fashion in producing the 20th century city. These forces culminated in a communal civil war. In 1946, the civil war enforced the territorial division of the city into a Hindu city and a Muslim and its Muslim ghettos. In post Second World War Calcutta, that is Aditi's question, ghettoization of the Muslim minorities took place along with the partition's demographic shock. Jobot Dakhal, that's a vernacular term for forcible and collective encroachment on public and private property, became a new force of frontier urbanization beyond the planned suburbs of the improvement trust. The protagonists of Jobot Dakhal were newly dispossessed people, the victims of the foundational violence of the two nation states. Jabot Dakhul was a combination of encroachment as class and encroachment as community, as I was telling in the first uh, answer. As encroachment as class, it snatched property from the wealthy owners and the state. Obstruction, because land is getting sunk in, in various forms of encroachment. As encroachment as community, it dispossessed and displaced petty Muslim property owners becoming an electrifying agent of Hinduization of the urban space. According to the government's estimate, I don't want to go into those things, but you know, uh, uh, there was at least 2.39 million acres of land under refugee colonization in Calcutta uh, and in adjacent districts, uh, which included privately owned properties, state properties, and properties in the hands of the state corporations. Jabot Dakhal involved violence, agitation, and displacements of refugees, as well as the existing populations by refugees. Thus, Jabot Dakhal led to the fragmentation of capital sunk in land, especially in the emerging frontiers of the city. As a result, the connection between urbanization and capital accumulation, okay, that is what is motion to me, as we found in interwar era, collapsed for many years in the post-colonial metropolis in connection with a fledging competitive electoral politics. Okay, returning to, uh, you know, refugees were not the, and you know, refugees were not the only population to build this new city in 1950s. Demographically, the most numerous among the, among the migrants to the city were ex peasants and landless agricultural workers from various districts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, especially a section of the urban poor those who migrated from West Bengal's rural districts made the sidewalks their home and stayed there for decades. Uh, the hawkers were remarkably successful on their, uh, in their collective encroachments of Calcutta sidewalks between 1950s and 1990s. Over these three decades a special, of spatial expansion, the demographic profile of the hawkers also underwent a change from refugees to, you know, uh, Dalit migrants. Uh, so by the 1970s, hawkers had emerged as an organized political force in the city, turning the sidewalk into a veritable livelihood resource for ordinary city dwellers struggling for survival. And hawkers' economy does not work like corporate economy, law of motion of capital. Okay, hawkers' economy works in a very different logic. The logic is livelihood. 
Okay, so that is where I think a productive distinction between motion as as capital and motion and obstruction as livelihood becomes important. And just one point I wanted to say, in a dialectical universe, motion and obstruction are not separate entities. There is obstruction in motion and there is motion in obstruction. So it depends on how you identify, okay, in what historical context and it through what methodology, right? So I just wanted to say that it is more complicated than separating motion and obstruction and calling something motion. You, what you see is a synthesis, obstructed motion. As Marx, for example, pointed out, it is consumptive production or productive consumption. Production and consumption unity, for example. So unity of opposites, unity of disparates in diversity. So this is something that I think I tried to do. Thank you. Um. Thank you, uh, Ruto and Yemen. This is like, what an amazing discussion. I have so many questions of my own, but we're running out of time. So maybe I'll ask you later. Um, but also, uh, I guess to end now, uh, thank you very much for your very, very theoretical, very insightful papers. I have learned a lot and I hope the audiences have to. Thank you, Antina, for your really, really remarkable comments and engagements with both the papers and for your questions. Thank you to the audiences for your questions as well. Um, I see one more question. Okay, no, it just says, thank you from an audience member. Um, okay, so yes, I guess we can um, end the webinar now. Thank you very much. Thank you, thanks a lot. Thank you all. Thank you.